All right, let's read what he has to say about uh, Fisher. The legendary American Grandmaster was an aggressive, try-to-win-at-all-cost kind of player. Possessing opening preparation that was ahead of its time, the work ethic of an Alyakin, the technique of Capablanca, and a will to win that terrified literally everyone he faced, Fisher bulldozed through the world's best players on his way to the highest title. Though Fisher played ultra-sharp openings like King's Indian and Night Orf as black, and won E4 as white, don't make the mistake of pegging him as an attacking player. He was a style based on iron logic and deep positional ideas, and he was happy to leap into an endgame, secure in the knowledge that few could challenge him at this stage of the game. Fisher's love of bishops was well known, that's what I said, and his magnificent handling of them in the endgame has never been equaled. Our first example is an excellent illustration of Fisher's incredible chess education. Now, I will say that, you know, Fisher did have a lot of nice wins in Bishop Endgames, but mm -hmm. to act like Karpov wasn't his equal after, you know, because he said since nobody's equal. This is ridiculous, of course. Karpov. Really? Yeah. Karpov's great. I mean, we saw his opposite color Bishop Endgames that he wins mm -hmm. earlier in the book, even. So this is the same color Bishop. We might do another in-game book sometime, Max and Jack, but... Yeah. I think what we're going to do next is more some middle game yeah. planning and other ideas that will help the middle game. Hey, Phoenix. Hey, Pet Serious. Do you know my uh, my nickname for Fisher? The F word. The F word? <laughs> yeah. Yeah? The F word. <laughs> Are we playing... Oh, we finished that portion of the stream, but we will maybe play a little bit after the book. Yeah. Well, we got to finish up this book, then it's play time. You work hard, <laughs> then you play hard. Just like when you're in school. You do a little school work, then you get a recess. All right, so this is Taimanov against Fisher, although this wasn't the Taimanov game that I was thinking of. From Buenos Aires, 1960, black to play. Poor Taimanov suffered in several games due to Fisher's skill in Bishop Endgames. His comments from his excellent book, Taimanov Selected Games, gives us a taste for what he went through in this game. So here's Taimanov's quotes. I got into time trouble, and before the control, I missed a sure win. But in the adjourned position, I still had winning chances. Fisher faced a difficult defense. My colleagues took bets. Bobby won't save the game. Such accuracy is required. That was Taimanov quoting the other people that said that. Uh, can you put the names? And Oh, okay, okay, I'll do that. Let me finish this yeah, paragraph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And indeed, when after tactical complications, the game went into an endgame where Bobby was a pawn down, one sensed that the correct decisions would not come easily to Fisher, and that he was balancing on the edge of the abyss. But then the critical, most important position was reached, and Bobby suddenly began playing quickly and faultlessly, like an automaton. <laughs> he rattled off more than a dozen difficult moves within a minute, and the draw became inevitable. Stunned by such a finale, I asked him, Bobby, how did you manage to find the saving path so quickly? I didn't find anything, said the contented Fisher with a smile. A few, a few years ago, your magazine, Shakmati vs. SSSR, published a detailed analysis of this endgame by Averbach. I've heard the story, actually. And I remembered all the variations perfectly well. Yeah, I remember that Fisher... Uh, I remember this now. In mm -hmm. this game, Fisher defended it perfectly and instantly and it was because he just knew analysis that he he learned russian in order to read like the soviet informants and stuff wow so he knew the defense because of that actually time and of the f word yeah all right, so let's look at the game finally that Silman and Taimanov are done talking. Mm -hmm. Bishop G3. Did I make it black to move? Yes. Any uh, funny things here to say? Taimanov trash-talked. Yes, yeah, his friend's trash-talking. He learned Russian. Yes, he did. All right, Bishop G3. The bishop and d-pawn will form a block to the white king. 
that will force white to part with the g pawn in exchange for black's d pawn. The resulting position, though seemingly dangerous for black, is in fact a force draw. Taimanov played this. So Taimanov's like almost winning here, but he says it's a force draw. And this is what he was talking about, the bishop and pawn stop the king from escaping. So can't do it like that. Bishop b4. Here comes the king. Bishop e1. Bishop f4. Threatens d2, which wins, of course. Having to give up the bishop there. So bishop c3, now d2, king e2 would be okay. Bishop g3, again, he's trying to cut the king out. Now, bishop h4 would not be the correct defense. Bishop e5, x-clam. Oh, really nice. Obviously, if you take it, you can't catch the pawn. Mm -hmm. But the point is that you can't put your... You, I'm going to play g3, so you can't keep your bishop here, so then I can go try to collect your pawn or at least prevent it from queening. Bishop e7. Bishop g5. To stop this. Here, threatening bishop f4. And wins. Pawn up. We looked at similar positions earlier in the book, actually. Okay, so king e7. Bishop e1. Having sidetracked black's king, it's time to free his own king from the cage. Despite all his rage. <laughs> Check. And g3. Now, he's going to go here and take your pawn, so you might want to play here, but then bishop g3 again locks you in. So g3 is the way to make progress. So he got his king out at the price of his doubled pawn. White's still much better, though. He could try to collect this pawn because it's stopped. Mm -hmm. And his king can also run over here after that. So care is definitely required. Bishop f4. A very interesting try discovered by Silman's best friend, Jack Peters, is, and I don't know if they're best friends, but he always talks about them. Yeah. <laughs> Bishop e3. Bishop b4. They're probably just chess buddies, you know, studying chess. King f6, bishop f4. However, black holds. King e6, x clam. King g6, double question mark. King e3, d2, king e2 would win. We, we will win the pawn. But king e6 is double x or regular x clan. Now why does this work? Let's see. We still win the pawn, but his king is approaching now. Or if it was on g6, it wouldn't do anything. But here it is approaching. Here to stop this. Uh, I'm sorry. Did I mess this up? King, queen takes king d5, bishop g5. He, it's actually king e5. Instead of, I just assumed it was king e4, I guess. Okay, I don't really know why you'd play king e5 instead of king e4, but sure, whatever. And then king e4. I'll come back to that <clears> part. Like, hey, bowler. Here, there. King d3. I feel like that just keeps going. Okay. Bishop b6. Always play bishop f8. Bishop c5. Always do that again. So white's trying to approach, try to take the pawn while he's doing that. A lot of random moves. Yeah. <laughs> King e6, interesting, equal. Well, obviously white's a little better, but it should be drawn. Um, let's back up 
and take a look at this variation a little bit. Like this moment especially, why would you prefer king e5 to king e4? Like why, how could that be better? I don't know. I have no idea. I just want to go there. I mean, let's say he wants to stop you. I guess it's king e2. That must be it, huh? That must be it. Because if king e4, king e2. So king e5, king e2, king e4. Now it's sort of Zugzwan. Not really Zugzwan, but it's sort of Zugzwan because if you move your bishop, I can approach. Mm -hmm. And then if you push your pawn, I can go here. And then we can get the same position where my king is here, your pawn is here, and your bishop's on this diagonal, just like we saw at the end. So that must be why. If king e4 first, king e2. Now, well, it's still black and like waste a move, so I don't know. And then go here. I mean, either way, we can move our bishop on this diagonal and stop this. But then that allows this. Okay. Okay. Well, okay, this would be better for black to avoid that anyway. To not be in Zugzwang, even though it's not even really Zugzwang. <laughs> Just to avoid it anyway. So that's fine. There are some other interesting points about this variation. I don't think like the bishop moves matter too much. So what white's trying to do is like make it such that black will like waste a move. You know, if black, for example, plays king f4, g5, king f5, that'll cost one more move than if black makes a, a useful move, g5, king f5. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to like sort of make him do that, I guess. King e3 lets the king up anyway. I don't know, these moves seem a little weird to me. I mean, that makes sense. I think the point is that they're just moving around trying to find a way to improve for white without playing g5, right? Because once you play g5, king f5, it's tough to move this mechanism. Yeah, these moves all make a lot of sense. Yeah, now the moves all make sense to me. Yeah. Okay. So the moral of the story is black is drawing if he loses the pawn, if his king can be in the center of the board and stop the white king from approaching. But this sort of play will generally lose because I can just move my king up now after I take your pawn. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know if the variation is so instructive as much as the idea. But, well, what can you do? Okay, let's see where the game actually, what happened in the game. Uh, let's see, bishop f4 was played. Here. No, no, it was a different bishop f4. Here it was, hey, this why, Bishop F4. How do we get so many viewers? <laughs> <laughs> you always ask that. Yeah, we do have so many viewers. That yeah. is more than I would expect. <laughs> in game <laughs> fanatics. <laughs> they love the end game, yes. I wonder if we're on chess TV. Let me just look real quick. I'd yeah. rather be on cheese TV. Because <laughs> um, I am a cracker. <laughs> a little racial humor there. <laughs> <laughs> Very little. <laughs> Let me see. I'm not even logged in over here. Anyways, king h5. All right, well, who knows? King e4, king g4. <laughs> king takes d3, king f3. So this is a similar scenario that we just analyzed in the variation mm -hmm. when the pawn and bishop were up here. But now the pawn and bishop are back here, which creates different challenges. Knowledge never hurts. Fisher, no doubt, was playing fairly rapidly at this point. Well, of, well aware that the avoidable exchange of the g-pawn for his b-pawn would lead to a position he was well acquainted with. Well, the way that I understood the Taimanov quote was that he actually was playing slowly until he got to the um, technical endgame that he knew was a draw that he mm -hmm. read in the book. So it might be that he was playing quickly, but that's what I thought Taimanov was saying. 
Okay, king f3, bishop c7, bishop f2, bishop d6, bishop e1. A little dance ensues. White takes his time, a little bit of cat and mouse, before winning black's b-pawn in exchange for his g-pawn. Yeah, you guys remember that cat and mouse. Mm -hmm. Who knows what happened here. Oh. F5. I wonder if we missed a raid or something. It seems like if there were a raid, though, people would say something. Like, hey, we came from so and so. So I don't think that's King what F5. happened. This prevents the pawn from advancing to g4. Oh, thanks, Happy Pineapple 007. Yay. 2,000 wow, bits. Wow, that's thanks. a lot of bits. Yeah. Thank awesome. you, Happy Pineapple. Nice. Now we're happy pineapples. <laughs> Why wouldn't white capture the pawn? Well, if white does capture the pawn, black would not trade bishops. That would be like, you'd have to pay black to do that for you. He'll take this pawn. And white will do that. White will take the pawn and will trade those pawns. So don't worry about that. But like uh, Silman was saying, he's playing a little bit of cat and mouse first. As we learned from earlier in the book. So finally he does take, yes, like you were suggesting. Uh, Barbie, and then takes back. <laughs> Fisher, what, what's so funny? This is a funny name, Barbie, Barbie Bimbots. Barbie Bimbots, <laughs> yeah, that is pretty funny. Now, according to Silman, Fisher takes no more than 60 seconds for the rest of the entire game, just banging out moves. Let's admire him. Here, obviously, if we push, we take it now. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that this might not require too much time of thought, if he already knows it, especially. This threatens that. Forcing white's king to give ground in order to advance the pawn without allowing the sacrifice. See, now his king had to go backwards in order to do this, and now the pawn can advance. It turns out that from this diagram, if Fisher played king f5, which he did not play, the position from the game Capablanca Janowski, New York 1916, would have been reached after king d5. Exact same position. Amazingly, Janowski resigned. At that time, analysts er erroneously justified Janowski's decision by presenting the following line. King f5, king d5, bishop b6, bishop d4, bishop c7, b5, bishop d8, king c6, king here, bishop b6, bishop g5, bishop c7, stopping the bishop from going here so we can try to win. Probably bishop e3, I'm guessing. Yes, here, bishop f2, there. All we can do is wait now to go there to stop that from winning. But we already know this is winning because this diagonal is too short, remember? Mm -hmm. The diagonal is too short, you'll get Zugzwan or just lose easily, actually, like here. That just loses without any more calculation. So this would win, and this is what this is why Janowski resigned. However, even here, it's actually not uh, it's not losing because of what Fisher did here. King f4, exclam! Brilliant move. It was only years after the Capablanca game that Fisher's defensive scheme bringing the king over the top of the pawn instead of the front of it was discovered. So Fisher already knew about this, as we already talked about. Hey, two bishops about to else. Hey, Thanks, two, two bishops about to else. else. Thank hey to you. the beautiful Karen and the very handsome GM Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bishop c7. Thank you, two bishops about to else. King c5. King d3. So this is what he means. He's going around town mm -hmm. instead of like Janowski trying to run in front and getting getting sh uh, boxed out. Not really shouldered out, but boxed out by the by the guy. And then here we go. This is the move. You ready? I'm ready. King c4. Stopping you from taking because someone will take this. Oh, another cheer. Thanks, Casper. Oh, Yay. now we got a train going. Thank you, Casper. 
Yes, thank you guys so for wait, the train. No, let me think about it for a second. So if you took the bishop... We'll take the pawn. So you can't take the bishop. Well, you could draw, I guess. And if black took the bishop last turn, this would be the e easiest meant. win. I ever. Take oh. the, yeah, okay, obviously. Frankly. Okay. So here. Is there, oh, I see now. Bishop b6. Mm -hmm. Bishop a7. And now this is the idea. Bishop c7, x clam. Draw agreed. They just immediately agreed to the to the draw. And that's fair. You can't stop me from playing this move now, ever. Unless you want to lose your pawn. And if you can't stop this, then you can't go there. Right. Well, your only way to stop it is to go here, but then your pawn can't move, right? Mm -hmm. The only way is to go here, and then I'll just move away. And now, if you go this way to stop bishop c7, I, I have this diagonal. Oh, that's right. So there's no way to make any progress. And Fisher had already seen this before, and he was banging out all the moves instantly. So draw agreed. Fisher guy was pretty good to defend a pawn down <laughs> an endgame that could be considered lost even years before. Yay, thank you, Marcus Thanks, Market Sands. Sands. 300 clovers. <laughs> Yay, thank yeah. you. Amazing defense. Yes, absolutely. Our next example is a complicated endgame where Fisher has his favorite bishop. Uh, Fisher mixes mathematical precision and fine art, creating one of the greatest endgame performances of all time. Ah, uh, yeah, this is the Fisher Taimanov that I know. This is a different Fisher Taimanov game. Everything's Fisher Taimanov. No, I haven't understood everything, Polo. I mean, this last part has been pretty high level, mm -hmm. but a lot of it I did. Even even some of the sections where it was above my playing level. But I felt like I wanted to just finish the book, <laughs> mm -hmm. even if I didn't get everything. Spencer was happy. He got to learn some things. Yeah, I still am happy. Yeah, because there were some things more at his level. All right, so same people, colors reversed now. So Fisher's got white. And Fisher's got his favorite bishop, all right? Mm -hmm. This is Vancouver 72. This must be when he was becoming world champion and he won 6 0 against Taimanov, I believe. White's advantage is clear. The bishop is far more active than the knight. White's rook is more active than black's rook. Black's king has no way into the enemy position, while white has a path, white's king has a path down f1, a6 diagonal. And black's kingside pawns are all on light squares, meaning they will be permanently vulnerable to attack by the bishop. Yeah, this is a tough endgame. Here, this. Black is hoping to trade rooks and swing his knight to d6, where it will create a complete blockade, depriving white's king of access to c4. White doesn't mind the swap of rooks, but he'll only allow this to happen once he prevents the knight maneuver to d6. So if these rooks come off the board and the knight goes around town to d6, that would be the optimal defensive setup. Then you can't bring in your king because the knight covers those two squares. King e2, x clam. It's important that white's king can recapture on d3 after the rook exchange on d3. For example, if you play rook d3 first, takes, takes, you're not pinning the knight anymore, so I can do a knight maneuver when black forms an unbreakable blockade after here, there, there. So white's doing everything he can to try to not allow that blockade. But here we go. And here. Note that after b4, king f6, takes, takes, you still can't enter the position. The knight and pawns make a perfect seal mm -hmm. for the king. Hey, thanks for 200 more bits. Yay, two thank bishops you. Of thank you, two bishops of Vatels. Knights are tricky. That's true. <laughs> yes, yeah, The well, too bad in this variation the b6 pawn is gone, but yes, he does love the b6 pawn for sure. <laughs> so, the point, of, the moral of the story is you can't allow the knight here if you trade the rooks. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to trade the rooks and then the knight's still pinned. 
and his king can just run in real quick before you get unpinned and maneuver around. King d8, unpinning. If you want to avoid the rook trade, which he didn't want to, time enough, there follows king d3 to c4. Now you can get some counterplay this way, but we can force the check anyway. Now you can start to maneuver around like we saw, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we can take. Zook's one. King has to back up. And Zook's one again. Black must allow white to clean out his pawns on one side of the board or the other. Here, there, etc. Or you let me go in here, etc. Mm -hmm. Mainly, etc. King d8 is what Taimanov did. Here comes the trade. There it is. King d3. Yeah, so now black didn't have time to play knight d6, so the king is pe penetrating on the queen side. Get in there. Or just take that. Whatever. Whatever he lets us do, we'll do it. White now threatens to trade bishop for knight and get the winning king and pawn endgame. So he has to move it. We already saw that endgame should be winning. Bishop e8. Starting a magnificent sequence where the bishop ties the knight down to the defense of the pawns while simultaneously forcing black's king back so that his own king can advance. Yes. King d5. Check. Kicking the king back so we can go into c4. Check. Again, kicking the king back. So now we can go up to b5. The bishop's dominating the knight and the king. At the same time. Exclam. The bishop's a bully. Forces the king's hand. He must give up control of either a6 or c6. It's important to note that Fisher could have ruined the masterpiece by going takes double question mark, double question mark, mate. <laughs> that would have been too funny. <laughs> yeah, that's when your king position's too good. <laughs> you got mated. <laughs> this kind of helpmate in the endgame has been known in some American circles as a Nigel Short. Yes. Yeah, do you know that one? I think Actually, I showed it. I showed it in a lecture. Um, Not, Nigel walked his king up, he was yeah. crushing it, and then mate. <laughs> oh, <laughs> too funny. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah he got once. mated. Well, no, I'm not talking about the king walk where yeah, he yeah. mates the guy. Yeah, I, I mean know. the one where he walks his king and gets I think mated. He, he himself get mated. Yeah. yeah, I forgot who his opponent was. <clears throat> Dang. Oh, well. But yeah, Nigel Short famously lost a game like that. Mm -hmm. Too funny. But you that can't blame funny. him. He just always walks his king up. Right. At every game. <laughs> This threatens king a6. 97. Okay, here's some analysis. We've been a little light on analysis so far this game. Knight d6 check, king a6. Let's look at this variation. In the game, he played knight e7 instead of knight d6 check. Mm -hmm. This also loses for black. Let's look at several variations. Let's start with knight e4, hitting the pawn. Bishop f7. Takes, takes. This is also like a Zugzwang scenario, right? Or potentially a Zugzwang scenario. Knight e2. So this is how he's trying to get out of it. But the problem is takes bishop f7 x clam, dominating the knight. And then we can push our pawn. He can resign, it says. If you move the king, I take it. And. If you play knight d3, this move actually wins more material. Well, I guess it doesn't really, because you can take the pawn for this pawn, but obviously this pawn's more valuable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'll just queen anyway. Okay, so instead of knight e4, c4 is a possibility. Bishop g6 to h7. Try to collect that pawn. We couldn't go to f7 because it was covered, you know. Knight e4, takes, takes. We're in the same scenario over here. Big check. f7. So he's trying to make Zugzwang like this, where you have to move your king or knight, and you can't protect everything. Bishop f7, knight e2. This is the way to not lose a pawn, at least. 
Bishop, Bishop D1 X Clam, Kasparov analysis here. And Kasparov just ends his analysis here and says that White White wins, <laughs> which is crazy. Obviously, <laughs> it's like you're in the middle of analysis here. In fact, he says it might seem clear to Kasparov, but let's check a few more. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Classic Kasparov. Well, obviously, this one. Uh, it does look pretty winning now. I'll give it to Kasparov. Even still, he needs some technique, right? Oh, look at this. Beautiful stuff. Bishop stops the pawn and dominates the knight. Mm -hmm. Yes, the pesky knight continues to dominate black's pieces. This would definitely win. The game might finish. He actually even continues from here. Here. Check. There are other ways to win, but this Silman likes this move, he says. And now it's clear that white's going to win if you do nothing. So you might as well try something. But this gives away the queen side a bit. Oof. Step away from the vehicle, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it goes here. Not the first time I heard that. And now white wins. <laughs> Just goes over here. And the bishop stops the pawn and the king. Dang, bishops are better than knights. Who would have thought? All right. So, because of all that analysis, white is winning by force. Is the matter, is fact of the matter after after knight d6 check. So he tried knight e7. Not that he calculated all that, but you know he just played a move. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> like, well, everything looks like it's losing, so just play one move. Here, I mean, he calculated a lot, obviously, but. Come on. In fact, here it seems like black has managed to keep white's king off of a6. But now the bishop regroups and manages to create a lovely zugzwang. Here. There. Now, if you move the knight, I go there. So you have to go here. You have to move the king back and forth. Check. If king a7... C4 exclam forces the king into the camp. You can't move your king here or backwards loses this. So knight g8. King c6 to d6. All right, we'd already assume it's winning once our king gets in, but we can keep looking at the analysis for a bit and wins. Yeah. Just take all the pawns. But once white king's white's king gets in, you you were going to lose with mm -hmm. black for sure. Unless you can somehow make a pass pawn and create counterplay, but yeah, not likely. Even <laughs> still, we have a bishop, so our bishop can stop past pawns. Yeah, I told you this part's really tough. So low. <laughs> it's even tougher if you know you're following Kasparov's analysis, where he just says the position wins. <laughs> and it's like in the middle of the position. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> All right, King C7. We'll get through it, and then we're going to start some easier stuff next. Stream. So he did get his king into a6 is the moral of the story. He got his mm -hmm. king all the way in there. And now the next step is to bring the bishop back here, continuing to bind the knight. I still wonder how we got so many viewers. I think we must have been on Chess TV briefly. Yeah, <laughs> that might be true. I think they just throw, throw whoever's on there. Bishop c4 is x clan, by the way. You want to go bishop c7, but after bishop, or bishop f7, I mean. But after bishop c4, mm -hmm. he's going to have to move his knight, right? Which he did. And then we go here with a tempo, because it's not defended anymore. And then he goes back. So by wasting a tempo, white gains a tempo. Funny how that works out. Mm -hmm. There's another variation here, king c6. Check, king c7. And bishop e8. That'll lead to the same position as in the game. Knight c6, bishop f7, knight e7. Bishop e8, same position as advertised. Zugzwang. This might be the greatest bishop of all time, says Silman, having completely outmaneuvered the whole black army. It now creates a winning Zugzwang. This is Zugzwang. If the king moves, you lose your pawn. Your knight moves, you lose your pawn. You can't lose your pawns, right? Then you'll resign. So the only move to try is this. Because then if you take this, I take that, right? Mm-hmm. So it seems like after white moves the bishop, we'll just go back. No problem. Except for one thing. <laughs> Boom shakalaka. The heroic piece now sacrifices itself. <laughs> after all that. 
It's too many pawns. White gets two protected pass pawns on the queen side against the clumsy knight. He also is going to have three against two on the queen side, by the way. Or on the king side, I guess, by the way. And the king can infiltrate over there. The white king can as well. Trying to hold off the pawns. King c7 also fails. b5. Scottish demon goat's getting excited here. A5. Knight c8. If knight g8. King d5, knight f6. King e6, knight e4. Takes, takes here. Well, that's 100% going to win. No doubt about that. Knight c8 is this other variation. King d5, knight a7. Uh, sorry, I lost my place for a second. King e6, knight b5. f6 would win. Always play f6. Wait, I don't think that's how it goes. So he <laughs> played knight c8 first. This will still lose, don't worry. And the last move of the game, b6. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And resigns. One pos possible finish could be knight takes a6, knight e4, check, check, here, and the pawn queens with check, so you don't have time to like play here and then try to fork me. <sighs> Won't let me do it. Uh, the per this perfect performance put Fisher up 4-0 in their match, so it wasn't the match that I thought, which mm -hmm. he ultimately won 6-0. Yeah. Yeah, this is a very, very, very famous endgame. Oh, Chess Bra is raiding. Yay. Nice, 446. <laughs> How's it going, Chess Bra? Yay. Thank you, Chess Bra. I don't know which Chess Bra it is, but love how's you, it going? Love you, Chess Bras. Whoever it is, we love you. <laughs> yeah, this is a very famous endgame. I've shown this to almost all of my students, if not all of my students. Yay. And, and I also don't look at much, uh, many endgames. All right, well, hang on. We've got to celebrate our Chess Bra raid all right. for a moment. Can you shout him out? I should. Let me do that right now. Oh, Yay. Kangaroo did it. Oh, kangaroo thank did you. It. He's on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> Love you, Chess Bras. Nice. I wonder if I'm still sub over there, Fam. I'll do my favorite emote. I am. Nice. I noticed today that I had emotes unlocked for, for Dania's stream. Yeah. And I didn't sub. To, so somebody gifted me a sub to his stream, and I didn't know it. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love the Amongasm. <laughs> <laughs> and the um, dad bod. Love this emos. Oh, that hits a little too close to home for me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, welcome all you chess bra people. We're finishing up. Um, we've been, we've been um, for several streams, going through Silman's, the, through a book, um, Complete Endgame Studies. And we're pretty sure we're going to be done with the book today. Yeah, in then, fact, let's look at the last thing. Yeah, and then Spencer's the going to teach us how to mate with um, a bishop and knight. Hooray. All right. So Hopefully I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you think Fisher was a one minor piece kind of guy, let's see how he handles a knight. All right. I believe that he could use the knight. Although, I, you know, I can't say for sure, but... I think he knows how it moves. And this will be the worst bishop ever, so don't worry. Is this still Fisher time at all? No. Oh. This is Fisher with black against Damian Damianovich. Okay, don't forget to change the name. I will. I'll forget. I mean <laughs> I won't forget. Um yeah, all of the past episodes are on the Chess Club YouTube channel. Yes. And some of the um, recent ones are still on Twitch video on demand. But since I'm only an affiliate, they don't keep my videos around as long as for the partners. But some of those are there. You need techno music? <laughs> yeah. I'll just go like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not a fan of the techno music. 
I like the way you move to the night. <laughs> I mean, the techno music, it all sounds the same. I mean, come on. It's kind of true. It all sounds the Although same. Although you are a fan of reggae, so I don't really know how, what to say about that. Um, but anyway, onward. So no Fisher has black music. here. This is from 1970. Here we have a classic case of a good knight against bad bishop. It might appear that black has no way to penetrate into white's camp, but the truth of the matter is that white is dead lost. R.I.P. King B5, preparing A4. 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 And he took. Check. It turns out that King E3, A3 is extremely strong, which fixes the A2 pawn and suddenly becomes a target, like if my knight gets here. Mm -hmm. For example, like this. Here comes the Manabra. Threatening to go like that, which would win the pawn. So you have to go here. Has Black's plan been foiled? Boom shakalaka. Exclam. Bishop c8 accepting the inevitable. B3, uh, B, BC b3 would obviously make a pass pawn. That'll win. So, knight b2 check, and it's all over. Here would allow the king in. Or, king e3 allows the knight to c3 with a check, which will win the a pawn and the game. So, if you took the knight, then they can queen. Okay. Yeah, if here or there, you can't stop me from queening. Okay. Pretty nice. You also can't go here. Well, if you do nothing, I take and go there. Mm -hmm. So doing so, that's why a, king a five, king b five a four is a really strong idea, because it's threatening a three, which would win because the a two pawn is weak, mm -hmm. and we can do some little tricks to get our knight in there. So that's why, instead, white took, which is logical. Although it seems like it would be bad to let the guy's king in, but as we saw, it's worse to let my let me take that a2 pawn. Right. Why do you think the a2 pawn is weak? Well, it can't move. That's one reason. And it can't be protected. It's a backwards pawn, really. Which is kind of weird because it's on its starting square. Usually those aren't backwards pawns. But it can't move to be protected by this pawn. And no pawn can go to b1. No white pawn is allowed to do that. So the pawn is weak. It's it's just can't. And it's hard to defend even. Like you'd have to play bishop b1, which is illegal. You'd have to go all the way around here. Mm -hmm. That's not where you want your bishop. <laughs> Trust me on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. So it takes. That's a better defense, certainly. Mm -hmm. King takes. Fisher calculated the rest out to White's resignation. Okay, Fisher could calculate all this in his sleep, right? Mm -hmm. These are all normal moves. King f7. Of course, it's hopeless. Yep. So at least he's trying. Knight f2 and e4. The alternative to king h6 would have been bishop takes e4. He played king h6. He could have tried this, and then here, so we protect our pawn. Now, if you go here, we take it, of course. So, and then queen our g pawn. And now black's clearest and most fun way of winning. That is important, <laughs> to play the most fun win. Right. Knight h6. Buys us a lot of time. Oh my goodness. See, remember, usually a rook pawn is a, is a draw, right? Mm -hmm. But not if we have our king in this in this area. Remember we talked about that? Yeah. So this is a win, as we'll see. We learned about this, actually. Yes, here and here. And wins. Yeah, we studied this in part six, he mm -hmm. says. I remember that. Yeah. Knight h6 x clown. So he took here. Let me fix him there. 
This just seems to happen occasionally. E3, E2, Queen, check, and after Knight E4, resigns. A good time to resign, since Queening fails to check, winning the Queen. So instead you could try to take, and then Queen. But we'll just trade Queens and win the game easily from here. Nice. We're all comedically challenged. We should make a support group. Hey, Karen. Hope you're doing well from Jay Cheatham. Hey, Jay Cheatham. Nice. Yeah, I'm doing fine. Let me just fix this for a second. Okay. I think what happens is this Mac loses the internet. Mm -hmm. That's fair. So it's just annoying. All right, so that was a short end game, not from Nigel short, but it wasn't very long. So we have another one to look at. This is the only one that has four examples. All right, hang on a second. All right, I'll just set it up. Like yeah. This. <laughs> okay. I think so. So Fisher will have black here. This is from the World Championship that he played against old Boris. I'll change the names. Is the chat saying anything funny or what's What is there? 5K chess was awesome. Was 5K chess? 5K chess. 5,000 chess? Yeah. I don't know. Hey, try not to learn. How's uh, it going? I only know about normal chess. <clears throat> you missed, we got a big raid from Chess Bra. Somehow we had a whole bunch before that. We're not sure. Maybe we were on Chess TV for a minute. <laughs> oh, what ha what's with all these bishops? <laughs> How did that happen? Get out of here. He's only got one bishop, bro. Do I accidentally add all those bishops? All right. So it's white to play. This is front. This is Fisher Spassky. Mm. Well, Spassky is white. Spassky Fisher. We've seen Fisher's skill with bishops. We've seen that he could wield a knight. And we've seen his enormous endgame knowledge. Let's finish our study of Fisher by taking a look at how he fares in an ultra-intense position with the pressure of the World Championship hanging over his head. A very complicated position. It's white to play, by the way. White has a bishop for three strong queenside pawns. That's obvious. What makes things difficult for figure out, to figure out are the following. One, with white's rook, which controls a1, King and Bishop all defending the queen side. How are blacks gonna how is black gonna queen the pawns, right? How big of a part will black's fourth pass pawn play? And finally, white has the option of pushing his H pawn to create a pass pawn of his own. So we have to figure out all of those aspects. How will black push the pawns on the queen side? Is the F pawn gonna come into play? And what about white creating a pass pawn with h5? Yeah. White creating. Um, yeah. Hang on. Organizing a sub battle. Accept your friend request. on. Okay, yeah, I haven't been on Discord in a couple of days. I will do that. Sorry that I missed that. An interesting aside is that chess engines like Fritz and Deep Jr. I haven't heard of these engines in years. You know? <laughs> it gives black an overwhelming advantage here. However, it should be about balanced, with a draw being the, the proper outcome. This should give the reader a glimpse into just how hard the endgame is to play. So let's look at a modern engine, mm -hmm. right? See what the modern engine says. Black's winning. Yeah, been streaming around 8.30 or so. Yeah, it says black is like a pawn and a half ahead, two pawns ahead. So it's, it thinks that black is barely winning, but when the evaluation is that low, it means it can't see us queening, right? Because mm -hmm. then it'd be like plus eight or mate or something. Right. So it's sort of uh, it's sort of on the fence. This is like a computer evaluation I would regard as on the fence in this position. Usually plus two is going to be winning, but if if you're queening your pawns and that's what's winning for you, but it's not, it's only giving you plus two, it might not be a win. Mm-hmm. Deep Junior, LOL. What does that mean? <laughs> That's a computer that I was like, I haven't heard of this computer in forever. Oh, Deep Junior? Yeah. Oh, okay. 
All right, so here Spassky played the best move. H5, X clam, an, an excellent move. White understands that passive defense won't save the game, so he sacrifices a pawn, giving black five pass pawns in the process in order to create his own passed pawn. C4, which this threatens to C3 check, which blocks the bishop, thereby enabling queening and winning the white rook. So rook a1 is forced. The two moves that white would prefer to play both lose. h6, check, queen, winning the rook. Still looks like, okay, some counterplay, right? Check. Forcing the king back. So now after that check, you know, we can play king c4 here. Nice. This is analysis by Gligerich. Gligerich says black wins here, and he's correct. Mm -hmm. Three pass pawns are going to beat the bishop. So h6 would lose. Uh, what else? hg. The game is over. If g7, ignoring the rook, rook c1, x clam. So now we can queen with check. <laughs> really nice variation there. Forcing mate. Bishop b2, instead of taking the rook, would still lose. Queen? And we can just stop the pawn from the front. So... Yeah, so that is all losing, right? Every variation I gave, I think. Did I give this one? No, no. After here, BC. Yeah, BC forces White's resignation because this is queening with check. So you don't have time. Yeah, Deep Junior. It is a funny name. It sounds like a porn star name. <laughs> well, the, the computer's name is Junior. Mm -hmm. Deep Junior is a version of Junior, like Deep Fritz deep houdini so you know or my favorite computer throat deep throat <laughs> now that is a porn star's name uh, <laughs> or a movie right mm -hmm. so rook a1 this stops the pawns from queening by force now he took g6 so now the game is just totally crazy h4 x clam g5 x clam or g7 x clam rather an old analysis by Purdy gives, takes, b3, rook g8, winning. However, instead of king c3, which is a blunder, bishop f6, x clam, is obviously better. Because now if you play here, I'll just protect my pawn. Mm -hmm. In the Purdy analysis, you just lose your pawn. And this also stops the pawns from moving, which is what Purdy was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Check check here it's not clear that this is winning Kasparov's answer to bishop takes h4 oh, sorry about that that's actually what he played is g7 bishop h4 Kasparov's answer is superior as you might imagine Frick g8 first not allowing this but allowing that, trying to get behind for check town. Rook d6 x clam to block the checks. Kasparov says one of black's pawns have, would have inevitably queened. Yes, certainly. When it's buenos, no checks. So g7 is the best defense. It should still draw. h3. Bishop e7. Threatening bishop f8. Always play that. Rook g8. Just reading. <laughs> Wait, what? Is that true? No way, right? <clears throat> Any comments on Dorsa Drakshani cheating at the U.S. Women's Championship? What is your source for that, Iranian? Right, that's crazy if true. Pig exposed. I don't. 
your name seems kind of rude. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because um, it implies that Iranians might be pigs. But anyway. Maybe it's just one specific Iranian. That <laughs> I haven't about. heard that. This guy's been trolling that and all that. Right. So yeah. he's just lying. That's what he thought. If Dark Shani was not going to cheat, right? Oh, well, maybe. I guess anybody could cheat. But. Yeah, I haven't heard that, so I have no comment. She seems like a lovely person. I met her uh, at St. Louis Chess Club. Yeah. And went to a couple of her <laughs> classes and and liked her very much. That's really all I know about it. <laughs> the following Bob Vinnick quote is quite interesting. Fisher finds a paradoxical solution. He stalemates his own rook, but blocks White's pass pawn and ties his bishop to it. Now five past pawns are fighting against White's rook. Nothing similar had previously occurred in chess. Spassky was astounded, and he lost. Soon Smyslov found a draw for White, but would he have found it at the board sitting opposite Fisher? Yeah, that's a good question. Bishop f8, exclam, always do that. This move entombs Black's rook. It's White's only good re reply. Two losing possibilities would be this, and that, which is, you don't even have to analyze that. Or bishop f6, which is strictly stupider than bishop f8. Well, I guess you, you could try to justify it because you're stopping these pawns, I guess. h2, king c2, rook e8, x clam. That's the problem with bishop f6 that allows the rook out if he needs it. Mm -hmm. Rook h1, check. Still looks like, I don't know if it's a win. Here it goes for the queen. And black wins, analysis by Kasparov. Yeah, he blocked the bishop, so you can't stop him from queening. And he stopped yeah. you from queening. You need to take it. So it's game over. Game over, man. Game over. Mm -hmm. So bishop f8. x clam. Yeah, it's chilly. You want me to turn it up? Yeah, thank God. Boop, boop, boop. It's freezing in here. I was actually also pretty cold. Yeah. I, I hate to admit it. Yes. H2? Yeah. This is better a better try than C3 check. I mean, both moves draw. And then H2. F4. So you can't take the pawn by queen anyway, right? So F4. F3. F2. Three pass pawns are poised to promote in the seventh rank, but the rook stops them all in their tracks, says Sittleman. Also, I noticed this happened in the game Nakamura Robson, although I think it was Robson Nakamura from a U.S. Championship. It was a dragon, and mm -hmm. it was super complicated, like end game, right? And Nakamura is instantly banging out all the moves, and Robson has all these pass pawns, like here, and Nakamura is just banging out moves, banging out moves, and then eventually Nakamura brings his rook down to the first rank, and the pawns can't promote, and Nakamura won. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, maybe he probably he's confident because he knew he know this he knows this game. Perhaps. Yeah. Maybe. Perhaps. Now, most Super GMs, I would say, obviously, they know this game and they've analyzed it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Nakamura might be the only exception. <laughs> he doesn't really know, like, no, classic historical games. games. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. really know that stuff. Maybe he knows more than when he was younger. Yeah, maybe. That's true. Um. No, actually, we know we didn't even finish this variation because I went on a tangent there. <laughs> King D3. Congratulations, Dast95, on your new rating, highest rating. Queen? Yeah. Or else the black king won't be able to go to the king side because the rook is cutting him off. It's a little bit of a deflection there. Or decoy. Rook f1, x clam. Bishop c5 with a draw. Yes, I mean, we can force a draw, right? We can take this pawn, mm -hmm. then take that pawn, and then take that pawn. And it's rook against bishop. Yeah. So that's a big draw. Yeah. Like, for example, here. Come on. There you go. Draw. Anal analy analysis by Soltis. Terrible. <laughs> All right, anyway, so he played I, H2 instead so of C3. So I feel like I would totally lose that. Rook so against that, bishop? Yeah. It's actually a pretty easy draw. It is easy. I can show you a technique yeah. to draw. Let's so see you that. put your king 
in the in the corner opposite of your bishop like that okay that's all you got to do so let's say black like tries to win by trying to win mm -hmm. you know like this i don't know i don't really know what black would do i mean in theory black should try to stop you from going there but i'm trying hey. to like go there so i can show you how to do it oh actually i've even blundered it look already. how wet he is Okay, so you're Dr. trying. McDowell was out there kicking some guy. What? I'm seeing it in the. <gasps> oh. <laughs> yeah. So you're trying to put. Okay, so you're trying. Right, to I'm trying to get to this position like this. That's what we want. And this is a well-known draw. We just put our bishop there. Problem is, you can't zugzwang me. You know, like if you go here, it's stalemate. Right? right. So it would be great if this was a white square bishop and this was here and this was there, then black would win because white would have to go in the corner and then we take your bishop, right? Mm -hmm. But because we are in the opposite corner of our bishop, our king is here and our bishop's here, you can't zugzwang me like that. It's just stalemate. And only Nigel Short would win. Also, let me show you a winning attempt and white doesn't work. You mean like here or what? Or just anywhere? Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, if you, <clears throat> I guess it's white's move, right? So bishop c, you can play bishop c5 or f4, I guess. Yeah. If you ever play check, you know, the other check, oh. and then and then attack the bishop, <clears throat> threatening yes. mate and the bishop, you always have check because the kings are lined up. Yes. You always have bishop e3 check. Oh, not this one. Right. Just that check. Yeah, you always have that in any position like that because the king's always on the wrong color. Mm -hmm. So if you ever attack the bishop, I can check you. Yes. Yeah, yeah this is a well-known drawing technique. Huh. The only way for the rook to beat the bishop is if the king is, like, trapped in the other corner. Mm -hmm. The corner, same as the bishop. And even that you can sometimes wiggle out of. But if it's, like, the perfect... In fact, somebody sent this, like, link about it, uh, if, like, weeks ago in, in our chat. They were like, hey, look at this analysis. It's just some guy. I don't know who it was. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was, like, a rook and bishop where it's winning for the rook because the king was in the bad square, like, the bad corner. Oh, yeah. And I explained to the person in the chat, I was like, usually rook against bishop's a draw, but this is like the worst version possible for the bishop, mm. so it loses. Should I make current events like crush one U.S. women's or players of the past? Hmm, that's tough. Maybe Cur uh Current events. Current. Yeah, current. definitely. Sure. Maybe I'll do both, because current events just won again. <laughs> I could do the last. Actually, there's two rounds today, so I could do two rounds. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's how you draw, like, rook against bishop. Karen was asking me earlier what the <laughs> prizes were in the women's. So crush won 25000 That's the prize. Mm-hmm. Other prizes on the way. That's not bad. So h2, king c2. This is how the game went. King c6. So far, we've heard from Kasparov, Botvinnik, Gligorich, Purdy, and Saltis. God, get those guys out of there. We might as well let Smyslov toss his voice into the mix, too. An exceptionally original position. Black's rook is shut out of the game, but the five passed pawns guarantee him at least equal chances. Rook d1. A key defensive idea. The rook stops the king from marching over to the king's side. Mm -hmm. Fully adequate defense, king c3. Fine move. Better, however, or easier at least, would have been king b2. f4. Also, we could analyze h1 equals queen, so that deflecting the king again so our king can run in. King e4, just make sure I get the square right there. And this is a draw, because your king steps away, and then I go back, mm -hmm. and then your king goes back, and I keep checking you. Or you lose your c-pawn, which you don't want to do, obviously, frankly. <laughs> so instead of h1, queen, f4 is another variation. Rook d6, rook d1, with a draw. Analysis by Gligorich. I guess black can't really make any more progress. Black needs to play c3, right? That's the mm -hmm. only thing he can do, but how? It's impossible. My king can't go here because of the bishop, and my king can't go there because of the rook. So, if, you know, you can't just play here, I'll take it for free. So there's no way to make any progress here. Right. I'd lose with both sides. That's correct. <laughs> Crush one with two rounds to go, question mark, says Kangaroo. Yeah, I don't know. Not following that. I didn't get <laughs> to see it. 
it's a draw, but it looks fun. That's also true, yeah. But if you can't make progress, you can't win by force. But you can win with, you know, trickery and deceit, of course. Mm -hmm. So king c3. H1, queen, x clam. We've seen this idea twice already. One time it was a1. Just to get allow the king in. Sacrificing this pawn is the only way to pull white's rook off the d-file and let black's king make a last desperate dash to the king side, where it will try to help the f-pawn promote. Purdy says less critical is f4. Check. King b2. <laughs> Similar to the line we just looked at. Mepek says I'd be pretty mad if I had five pass pawns and couldn't win. True. <laughs> That's why Fisher did win. He didn't want to be mad about it. <laughs> well, he did like to be mad. Takes. King d5. King b2. White is still keeping the draw in sight. Another way to split the point is rook d1 check. Rook e1 check. Now king b2. And rook c1. So he forced the king away, so now we can win the c-pawn. Etc. There, you can <laughs> want to force it. Just don't take this one. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. Analysis by Kasparov. King b2. F4. Check. Finally, Spassky makes a mistake and loses. Rook d1 double question mark. Spassky cracks under the pressure of the game and the occasion. A draw could have been reached by rook c3 check. King d4. If king e2, f3, rook c1, similar to what we just looked at. We'll take the pawn, we'll take the, all the pawns, and, and you'll have no pawns. So king d4 to try to protect the pawn. Rook f3, c3, king a2, c2. Check, check. Bishop a3 x clam. The bishop reemerges. Analysis by Gligerich. Timon takes this analysis a bit further. Takes, takes, rook c7, bishop b2. Take the pawn and queen. Why do we have to play bishop b2? Why can't we go here? I wonder, Spencer. But then we can go here take the bishop and queen, and we'll have queen against rook. So that's why you have to play bishop b2, as Timon points out. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Dang, nobody mentions that if king takes a2, it's rook a6. Oh, he did, he did. Yeah, he, Silman added that in. As was common with Fisher's endgames, one mistake Wait, one was turn. all it took. What were you just saying? If king takes a2, what now? Rook a7. Oh, okay, I thought you said six. I'm like, what were you talking about? I just didn't hear you correctly. Okay. <clears throat> Anyways, so he didn't play rook c3 check. Rook d1 check was what was played. King e2, x clam, rook c3, but now f3. White finds himself mm -hmm. a tempo down in an important drawing line. Um, where he takes on c4 brings his rook back to c1, and takes on b3 with the king. But now it doesn't work. If you take here and do this, we saw this idea before, we don't have enough time or tempo down. You can't take both pawns. So after f3, he played bishop c5. Not what you want to play. Kasparov points out that now and on the next move, the crude f3, f2 also won, but Fisher had his own, his own way to the goal. F, f2 would have won lot, that turn as well, according to Kasparov. Check. King f1, bishop d4, f2, and resigns. The end could have been rook f4, rook takes d4. King e2. Again, it's the same problem. If you go here and I queen and you take and I take, you can't take both pawns. Right. So probably you'll try to check me, right? But now you don't have enough room to check forever. If this rook was like further back, you could check all day and black actually can't win. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. The only way to hide is to go here, but then you can't queen your pawn, obviously. But the rook is too close. King f3, rook e8, queen. Etc. He even gives the analysis that we go over here and play. We promote and takes king a3. We've already looked at that earlier in the book, actually. Mm -hmm. A magnificent struggle. The end. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> we finished the whole book. Yay. End of book X clan. <laughs> yes. We did it. We're like Dora the Explorer. <laughs> nice. The, the book, book has been read. We did it. Now, <laughs> now rip it in half. Yes. Throw it in the fire. <laughs>